Mathematicians love patterns, but not all patterns are what they seem. And in this video, I'm going to share the most ridiculous patterns that you'd be convinced must go on forever, but eventually they fail. Now, before we get into the video, we have just rolled over 100,000 subscribers on this channel. Uh, honestly, it's kind of overwhelming. Thank you to absolutely everybody who subscribed or watched my videos. It helps so much. It's so inspiring. And I just want to do so much more with this channel. So I'm excited and I hope that you're going to be excited for what's coming up as well. First example is a bit of a warm up, but is a really cool geometric idea. So I want to begin with a circle here and I've added one dot to it. And I want to observe that there's one area inside of a circle. This is in contrast to an example where say I had two dots. And if I took those two dots and tried to connect them with a line, then what I would get would be two different regions of the circle. So the idea here is I'm going to be taking different numbers of dots, I'm going to be connecting those dots up, and I'm going to be asking how many regions in the circle are created. For example, with three dots here. Okay, I'll connect the three dots up. This creates one, two, three, four different regions. So with one dot where there was no connections, we got one region. Two dots gave us two regions and three dots give us four regions. Okay, let's do four dots now. Connect all of those up, count them up, and what you get, you get eight regions. So one, two, four, eight. Let's keep on going with the pattern. Five dots now. Connect all of those dots up. Count all the different regions that are formed. And what do we get? We get 16 regions. So what's our pattern thus far? We started with one region, two regions, four regions, eight regions, 16 regions. Can you guess what comes next? Now, I bet you're thinking 32, right? Okay, well, let's take a look. I'm going to put six dots around the circle. I'm going to connect them all up and let's just count the regions here. So there's a lot of them. It's going to take a moment for us to count. But what we're going to get, you're probably expecting 32. We get only 31 regions. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 31? What the heck? There actually is a different formula for this question, the maximal number of regions when you put n dots. It's this weird quartic polynomial here, and there's many different proofs for that claim. But the point is, it's a different pattern than the much simpler 2 to the n minus 1 that you were probably expecting. This next example is truly nuts. I'm going to begin with an integral. I'm going to begin with the integral from 0 up to infinity of sine of x divided out by x. I'm going to adjust this integral in the future, so just for now I'm going to come along and put the dx in as something extra. This integral is relatively challenging to do. You can do it with Laplace transform, you can do it with complex integration, but from a sort of first-year calculus perspective, this is a very challenging integral. So one thing that we can do is turn to Maple Calculator. Maple Calculator is the sponsor for this video and makes a wonderful calculator app that you can use on your phone. The links to that are down in the description. The idea is this. I'm going to come and click the camera button here, and I can come in, hover over the math that I've handwritten down, I swipe it, and what it gives is the value of pi divided by 2. That is, Maple Calculator knows how to interpret integrals and figure out what the actual value of them is. Okay, so let's write that down here. The answer to this is apparently pi divided out by 2. And let's keep on going. So I'm going to remove my dx, and I'm going to add another term. I'm going to write sine of x divided by 101, and then I'm going to divide it by x divided by 101, and now I'm going to put the dx on the far right-hand side. We'll do our trick with Maple Calculator again. I'm not going to put the equal to pi over 2, so that doesn't get covered. Let's see what it interprets. Once again, it figures out that this is pi over 2. So this integral is again the value pi over 2. Kind of interesting. Okay, so let's get the dx out of there, and let's do it one more time. This time I'm going to do sine of x divided by 201, and I'm going to divide all of this by x divided by 201. And once again, we get pi over 2 according to the Maple calculator. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit bored here. So let's stop putting them in, and let's try to think about what the general term looks like. I'll go dot, dot, dot. And my generic term looks like the following. Sine of x divided by 100n plus 1. So n could be 0, 1, 2, 3 here, and then divided out by x divided by 100n plus 1. This is all on the bottom. 
And then we can finally add our little dx on the far right hand side. Is this always true? Is this true for all possible values of n? We saw it true for n equal to 0, 1, and 2 via Maple Calculator. Now, are you ready for this insanity? This is going to be true for all values of n that are less than 9.8 times 10 to the power of 42. That is insane. For almost 10 to the 43 values of n, this is true. It is always equal to pi over 2. But look at this. It's going to become false when n is a number which is bigger than 7.4 times 10 to the 43. And in between these, it sort of wobbles around. So this is a pattern that appears true for an absolutely insanely large value of n, but eventually is false. Eventually, this crazy integral with 10 to the 43 factors in it will not evaluate out equal to pi over 2. These integrals, by the way, are related to Fourier transforms, and the exact argument about why this was true and, and how an integral like this was constructed to give such an outrageous value, you can see a link in the description that explains all of that. I'm not going to reproduce it here. The next thing I want to do is talk about prime numbers, numbers that are only divisible by one and itself. Now, I've put up on the screen here all of the odd numbers starting from 41. I know that even numbers are never prime unless they're the number two, so I just don't have to write those down, but some of these odd numbers are prime and some of them are not. This pattern I'm going to show you starts at the number 41. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first circle that 41. I'm then going to skip zero odd numbers, and so I'm going to go right to the next odd number, and I'm going to circle that one, that's 43. I'm then going to skip 45, that's skipping one odd number, and I'm going to go 47. Now notice all three of these are prime. 41 is prime, 43 is prime, 45 wasn't, but 47 is prime. I'm then going to skip the next two odd numbers and get to 53, that's prime. Skip the next three odd numbers, none of those are prime, but indeed 61 is. I then keep on this pattern. I skip the next four odd numbers, none of those are prime, but 71 is. The next five odd numbers, none of those are prime, but 83 is. The next six odd numbers, none of those are prime but 97 is, and you get the idea. I keep on eliminating the next seventh and the next eighth and the next ninth ones. This is gonna give you this pattern to generate all of the prime numbers starting at 41. There's a general formula for that, which is n squared plus n plus 41. So n equal to zero gives you 41, n equal to one gives you 43 and so on. And this formula is pretty good. It works for a while. It works between n equal to zero, which gives you 41, all the way up to, but not including 40. So in other words, you can, you can start at 41 and figure out the next 39 primes, all of them, by this formula. But it eventually breaks. If I plug 40 into the formula, so 40 squared plus 40 plus 41, well, I could put this together as 40 times 40 plus 1, which is just another way of saying 40 times 41. And well, look, that's just 41 squared. It's clearly composite. So this formula that works for such a long time and tells you so many prime numbers, very simply, it doesn't actually work long term. A formula like n squared plus n plus 41 is what's referred to as a prime generator. It's a nice little formula and it generates a whole bunch of primes in some region where it's allowed, in this case, zero up to 40. But there's, so then one can ask, and this gets to a lot of deep number theory about prime numbers, about, well, what about other prime generators? And indeed, there are other ones, and there's many different conjectures about the distribution of these prime generators in the entire sequence of prime numbers. Perhaps one of the most important categories here are called twin primes. Twin primes are things like 41 and 43. This is a sequence of primes generated by a formula just of length two, and the conjecture is that there's infinitely many such twin primes. All right, so that was pretty cool. Let's do our final one about prime numbers, and this one's a bit ridiculous. What I want to do to begin is introduce something called the pi function. And what the pi function does is it tells you the number of primes less than n. So for example, if I want to consider pi of 10, well, the primes under 10 are 2, 3, 5, and 7. Everything else is composite. So there's four primes under 10, hence pi of 10 is 4. So one of the things we want to do is try to figure out, well, what does this function pi of n look like? How, how can I figure out what it is? Now, there's a great approximation for pi of n. 
This is called lie of n, and it's the integral from 2 up to n of 1 over the logarithm of x dx. This is an integral. It's a thing we can compute. We can plug this into the computer, and we can ask the computer to evaluate this numerically. And superficially, it doesn't look like there's any connection to primes at all. But indeed, a very deep and important theorem, the prime number theorem, basically says that the ratio of these two things, the ratio between pi of n and li of n, is eventually just going to become 1 when n is large enough. And so sort of the growth of the one function and the growth of the other are very similar. Indeed, if you want to look at a table of values here, so it's kind of small, but this table shows n from 10 all the way up to 10 to the 27, an outrageously large value of n. And it looks at the difference between these two different functions. And what you'll notice is that even for the bottom row, even for 10 to the 27, this outrageously large number, the difference between them is only about 500 billion. I mean, 500 billion sounds like a lot, but in comparison to the 10 to the 27, it really isn't. Notice that the difference is always positive. For all of these values from 10 up to 10 to the 27, li of n is bigger than pi of n. And so you might think that this is always true, but it turns out it is not. But we know that somewhere around 10 to the 316, this outrageously large number, that it crosses. That it's, in fact, smaller than pi of n. And then indeed it's going to keep on crossing and crossing and crossing forever. This number, as outrageously large as it is, is actually vastly smaller than initial computations at the spot where there was a first crossing. And we don't even know whether this is the first crossing. It may be that someone in the future is able to find a smaller bound on when these two functions cross. But we don't know, and for an outrageously long time the function stays positive but eventually fails. So yet another example of a pattern that seems like it should be true forever, but eventually fails. All right, with that, if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. If you want to check out the Maple Calculator, there's the link to the description. Give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm, and we'll do some more math in the next video.